I can't understand, I can't understand the reason why um, the state is so opposed to the notion of ethnicity. Maybe it's because, you know, what ethnicity might bring, or what mightn't bring in some respects, but what it could bring obviously is an argument for improved services, better treatment, and, and a respect for our community. Um, and it is a reality, it's a reality of the state's reaction, not just sort of political rhetoric or political sort of, we're not doing this thing, when they use it, I mean, quite recently, in, in where, where Travellers have become organised enough to use international convention. You look at the collective complaint procedure, which sets out certain social rights. Ireland has been brought there a number of times. The most recent one is the complaint by the European Roman Rights Centre on behalf of Irish travellers. That decision has already been made. It's made and will be made public in, in the middle of the next month. But in the government responses to the actual complaint that was made, ethnicity was an issue. And, and you know, a declaration, a very bold declaration in the first government response that Irish travellers are not an ethnic group. So it is used legally, it's used in a legal context to try and prohibit um, any improvement in, 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 in respect of, of, of the tribal community in Irish society. Um, so it is an issue, it's an issue in respect of, of, of recognition. Now, as I said, I'm not going to argue for the recognition because I personally believe that travellers fulfil all of the criteria, all of the legal criteria, and I think any lawyers who look at that criteria would have to accept that as well. So why the lawyers on behalf of the state make an issue of it, uh, I'm not sure, but it's obviously clear because it's just political reasoning behind it. Um, uh, I'm not going to continue much because I sort of hope there will be some intervention when the floor some questions on it. I, I said, uh, what I wanted to say this morning has probably gone out the window to an extent um, because of some of the other thoughts that have, have sort of kind of came from the floor as well. So, and, and that's something I've been kind of learning a little bit about and a little bit from as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Um, and I suppose um, it's been said before that there is one form of Irish racism, and it's 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 um, it predated us having a lot of non-national colleagues living here, and it was the uh, discrimination against travellers, which has gone on for so long. Um, the um, the the next uh, topic um, is the issue of health equity, and we have Fiona O'Reilly who has been doing a lot of work, um, research and um, training work in the whole area of bringing um, health equity uh, centre stage in terms of healthcare policy and doing a lot of work in both Dublin and Limerick on that particular issue in, in surveys. So um, here with some very interesting contributions, Fiona Rag. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll, I have prepared something that I think I, I will stick to. I just say I'm a, a researcher and I generally am used to PowerPoints and stats and figures, so um, I'll uh, do my best to do without them and um, try and, and get across a few points that I want to contribute this afternoon. Um, premature death is the ultimate outcome of health inequality, but there are also outcomes that result in reduced health and quality of life. Health inequalities or inequities are avoidable differences in health between groups of people within countries and between countries. These differences arise from inequalities within and between societies. Social and economic conditions and their effects on people's lives determine their risks of illness and actions taken to prevent them becoming ill or treat illness when it occurs. My background working in um, tackling health inequality starts, um, well, I've been looking back, um, I never decided to go on um, a career path dealing with health inequity, but looking back, um, it seems to have its own story. I started out um, as a nurse um, 30 years ago, and um, I worked in humanitarian um, crises in Sudan, Somalia, um, Ethiopia, Afghanistan for a number of years. Um, over the course of my work as a practitioner, I found that um, people's rights were not respected. Their rights to basic things, food, water, water shelter, health, were not realized. Um, after a number of years um, working in this area, I began to um, look at home, at my own um, country and I found similar themes, similar in inequities that were sometimes harder to see um, because we're, we're far more used to them. 
um, but across across all of my experiences, either as a practitioner and they, then later as a researcher, it was clear that the worse your social circumstances, such as lower income or education, the less your chance of enjoying good health and a longer life. Research shows that the poor are more likely to experience chronic ill health, more mental health problems, more addiction problems, lower life expectancy, etc. than the rich. There are lots of evidence in health, of health inequalities in Ireland. For example, life expectancy at birth is six years higher for male professionals and five years higher for female professionals than their um, unskilled counterparts. Traveller infant mortality are almost four times higher than the rest of the population. A recent study that I led um, among the homeless population in Dublin and in Cork um, on behalf of the Partnership for Health Equity showed that homelessness is a very, very unhealthy state. 89% of the people we interviewed had either um, a physical or a mental um, diagnosis. 60% had mental health problems. And I suppose the most shocking um, uh, finding that literally jumped um, off the, the analysis uh, screen for me was that more than one third of the 600 plus people we interviewed had attempted suicide. That means every time you know, you're walking down Grafton Street and uh, you pass three people, one of those is likely to have attempted to be so low that they attempted to take their own life. It's a poor indictment of, our society, of the society that we live in um, as these results are a result largely of the social determinants of health. And the social determinants of health, that is, the social, economic and environmental conditions in which we grow and live um, and strongly influence our health, health, these are largely a result of public policy. The human right to health is protected in a plethora of international instruments. The rights and entitlements, rights and entitlements do not always translate, however, into health care or health attainment, as we can see with the homeless population. Why is this? Why, when we have the same rights and entitlements, do we don't have the same access to health care and experience of health? Even worse, why is it that those most in need of care and services are least likely to get them? In the literature, this is known as the inverse care law. Why is the child who was born in Somalia far less likely to reach their fifth birthday than the one born in Dublin? Why is the homeless person less likely to receive treatment for a mental health problem than the house person? Unfortunately, the answer is simple. Some lives are worth more than others. So who says so? Those who say so are those with most power and influence to dictate public policy and therefore influence the social and economic conditions in which people work, grow and live. Internationally, who said so? I'm afraid that's us, the minority, the less than 20% who consume the majority of the world's resources. On a country basis, systems and services are established to prioritise the people with most influence and then we often blame those that services don't serve rather than adapting the services. <coughs> Over the years, um, conducting research and um, showing that um, <coughs> marginalised groups um, have more adverse ha outcomes, yet have less access to health care. A number of barriers, simple barriers, that could be influenced by public policy um, emerge. For example, medical cards need addresses. Um, Psychiatry services are based on catchment areas and addresses. A&E requires that you can physically wait the eight to 10 hours or whatever it is that people, but people with serious addictions physically cannot wait. So therefore, they do not have access to care. It goes on and on. Unless we account for the difference and change policy services and opportunities for minorities within Ireland and indeed the majority internationally, equity will not be achieved. 
And I think the rights argument is the only argument um, to use. Um, I have an example of trying to change myself actually in Austin O'Carroll, who I, I think you're aware of. Um, we, we did a survey, a similar survey to this recent one with um, homeless people. In, we did it in 2005, and again, it showed homelessness was an unhealthy state. And we are, used the economic argument to say that the state will save money if we provide primary care services that homeless people can access put doctors and nurses into hostels and provide um, basic first level health care to homeless people. That will mean they won't have to go to hospitals and will save money. The economic argument might work. Unfortunately, our survey in, um, to, uh, to eight years later showed that this wasn't the case. The repeat survey showed that yes, there was more access, largely as a result of hostels work with safety net, there was more access for people to primary care in hostels and the like, but there was also increased access to uh, increased um, in increased numbers of people visiting A and E and being admitted as inpatients. Because the fact is, if you provide initial care to a very sick population, it's likely to mean more more are going to need more care, more uh, secondary services care. So it's not always cheaper to do the right thing. It's sometimes, it's sometimes more cost effective to let people die and withhold services. So I'd beware of depending on the economic argument. The right thing is sometimes the right thing regardless of cost. In the Partnership for Health Equity, and you can look up our website, which is um, healthequity.ie, we try and um, use um, influence education, particularly for medical education, and I'm involved in GP training, to um, help GPs understand the socioeconomic barriers that people face and help them therefore remove them, to teach them about the social determinants of health. And it's not just pathology um, that causes um, health problems. However, by the time in, uh, the injustice has shown itself in health outcomes, it's often too late to make a real difference. You can make a difference maybe to the individual, but it's difficult to prevent. Um, it would be, it's impossible at that point to, to prevent, say for example, the unhealthy state that homelessness is. The best thing you can do to address the poor health of homeless people is to prevent homelessness provide accommodation, housing. The best thing you can do to ensure the Somali child survives to his fifth birthday is to pro provide stability and security. The best way to improve mortality um, <coughs> for the traveller population is probably um, rests on adequate accommodation, education and employment opportunities. Health outcomes are just that, outcomes of how people and society make decisions about who and what's important. Until the inverse care law, which states that those in most need of care are at least likely to get it, can be turned on its head, the right to health will not be realized. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona, very much. Um, so, um,